All right, folks, uh, we are two past the hour, so we're going to kick off our webinar. I want to note that um, you probably just heard that recording is has been enabled. So um, we are recording this session. We're also live streaming it on LinkedIn. So hello to everyone who's joining us through LinkedIn. Um, my name is Caitlin Augustine. I'm the Vice President of Product and Programs here at Datakind, and I'm so thrilled to be talking to you today about one of my favorite topics, um, which is using data for social impact. I'm joined here today by Rachel Allen, the Executive Director of the Peace and Justice Institute, and Sandy uh, Vidal, who is a Vice President at the Central Florida Foundation, um, two amazing women who are real champions of using data to drive community impact. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Sandy now for a quick introduction um, to, to welcome us here and just say, why is data so important? Why are we having this conversation? Thank you, Caitlin. I'm so happy to be here today and have the opportunity to watch alongside of all of you with the presentation. I've had the opportunity to hear Caitlin and the team a couple of times and even listen in on one of their data weekends where Data kind gets together and puts in practice all of the data that they're taking and uh, putting it into graphs and charts and maps and other things that will help to tell the story of what's going on in our community. So again, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. And on behalf of Rachel and myself, we are very excited about the opportunity to work with DataKind, that DataKind is in our community, and that we can learn more about how to take the, the data that is out there. I know I have a spreadsheet with about 200 different data sources, but looking at data and being able to tell the story of what's happening with that data are two different things. And so very excited about the opportunity to hear from Caitlin today about how DataKind takes the information that's available about things that are going on in our community and turns that into actionable items. And so I'm gonna turn it back to Caitlin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandy. And um, I'll actually offer just a quick anecdote um, that as we're going into what we're gonna cover today, you know, talking about DataKind, um, Sandy you might not even know this, but uh, part of my personal inspiration for using data for community impact. So not just data you know, to change the world, not just big data uh, for research and problem solving. Um, it was actually connecting with Mark Brewer, um, uh, the, the executive director of the Central Florida Foundation at one of UCF's conferences, their public administration conference, gosh, back in 2018 or 2019, where he, he gave a presentation on the sustainable development goals. And he said, these goals, using data to hit these goals, it's key. It's how all of our nonprofits are going to thrive. And that just stuck with me. And it, it really is part of why I'm so excited to be having this conversation with our global audience and also our local Central Florida audience. So really thrilled to have so many first timers to DataKind and this idea of data for social impact in the room today. Um, so what we're going to cover, um, I'll give you a little bit about DataKind, but really jump right into why should we be using data for social impact? And how can we do that? What are the steps or the tips that we need to do in order to make those great maps and draw those great insights that Sandy was just mentioning? And then we'll give a couple of case studies. I have three different case studies to tell you about that shows the type of impact we can drive forward um, and create positive social change. I'll give you a little bit about what DataKind learned, and then I'll invite Sandy and Rachel to come back on screen to talk a little bit about you know, how Central Florida is thinking about in, uh, using data for impact within the community. All right, so with that, who's DataKind? So DataKind, we're a global nonprofit, we're 10 years old, and our mission is to harness the power of data science and AI in the service of humanity. And we do this through partnerships with social impact organizations, with governments, nonprofits, NGOs, social enterprises, and we think of ourselves as that catalytic capacity. We bring our data, our science, our technology, our AI solutions to bear for organizations who are doing great work. And we just help them do their great work a little bit better. 
Um, over our 10 year history, we've done over 300 projects with over 200 partners around the globe. Um, we have headquarter offices in a number of global cities, and we're thrilled that over the past three years, we've built a deep and personal relationship in Central Florida as well. Now, when I say we're that capacity, it's also important to say, what do we think success is for Datakind? And so at Datakind, we think success is when Datakind and our partners, so Datakind and those social impact organizations together have created these solutions that contribute positively towards solving sector level problems. We're not interested in just going at this alone. We're not interested in just making the flashiest AI or um, visualization. We want to co-create solutions with individuals who are in the field, on the ground, um, uh, that we can make solutions that are sustainable and actionable long-term that contribute to changing some of these systemic issues uh, facing the world. So that's a big ambition. Why do we think that data for social impact should even be our starting point? Well, I'm going to start with a staggering statistic that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are gener generated every single day. And in the last two years alone, 90% of the world's data was generated. Two years ago, 90% of the world's uh, data that we have didn't even exist. Um, this is more than just our one spreadsheet. This is more than, you know, all the information in Google. Uh, this, is, this is an astonishing amount of information. And this information must be useful in some way toward driving impact. Now, it's also an overwhelming amount of data and an overwhelming amount of information. So how do we start and to use data for impact? Well, we actually start with the questions, not the data. And this is my first takeaway. And honestly, if you take away nothing else, from this conversation, take this away. Start with the questions and not the data. Start with the questions that keep you up at night as an organization, those service ambitions that you hope to do for your community, but you can't do because you're resource constrained, because you can't get from point A to point B, because you don't have some bit of knowledge. Start with those questions. The data will come, but one of the, the unfortunate things that we see from organizations early in their data journey is, an organization will come to data kind of say, I have this Salesforce database or have this list of uh, sites that I go to every day. What can you do with it? And we're like, well, we could do a lot with that. We can make maps, we can make charts, um, we can give you insights, but what do you want to know? What's that question keeping you up at night? And when we're working in the social impact space, those questions, they're really part of these wicked problems, right? You know, we're working on these things that are difficult or perhaps even impossible to solve because of the intricacies, because of the overlaps, because of the contradictory and changing requirements. So we need to be very sure about the questions that we're asking because we're trying to focus on taming a portion of that. You know, no one on this call would say, oh, we're going to solve poverty. Boom, we'll do it. Here's our roadmap. We're done. Uh, but we might say, we can get more homeless people into stable housing. We can offer job retraining to get more people employed. We can work on components of this problem to tame it. And data can be a key part of ensuring that intervention successfulness. Now you might say, great, I am so early in my data journey. I'm so far away. I don't know how I can even form those questions uh, to, to be able to say, okay, what is keeping me up at night? How can I use data to solve it? Well, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Fundamentally, data can be used for three things. Data can be used to help us observe the state of the world. So to do this, data science and AI can help you identify data, access that data, and validate that you trust the data. But first, it helps you paint a picture. It helps you say, I know how long it takes to drive my car to uh, the gym. It lets me say, oh, I know how many tacos my family needs to order for dinner tonight. Data is all around us, and it helps us observe what is happening in our world and our surroundings. And once we have that observation of the world, data and data science allows us to reason through. It allows us to say, what will happen next based on my observations 
of the world. So I might say, I run a, um, a nonprofit in my community and I know I serve 500 people a month and that's been increasing um, every month for the past six months. I may be able to anticipate it's going to increase by another 500 people. Data, having that observation will then let me reason through what's happening next in the world. And then data science and AI, that can help us understand the data, anticipate outcomes, and process how we want to take action. And that's the next step. So once we've observed the world and reasoned through the world, we can use data to drive action. Um, this help is how we can create change to drive something closer to our goal state of the world. Data science, AI, this can help us propose solutions and identify new opportunities. It could be the automation of uh, record keeping. It could be, you know, increasing using um, GPT-3 or uh, to, to write your marketing emails so that you don't need to do those anymore. Um, it's a way of driving action. So observe, reason, act. This is the framework for what we can do with data in the world. Now, how can we do this in a way that is successful, equitable, and positive? Well, we need to start with ethics. We need to prioritize privacy and data management from the start. And this could look different for every organization. And it is important that we understand the aims of an organization, the aims of our stakeholders, and how we are engaging with the world. So when we think about um, you know, the prioritizing ethics from the start, it's not just about what happens if a project fails. We can think pretty clearly about what happens when a data and technology project fails. You don't get the outcome you hoped for. You don't have the tool you've created. But what about the ethics of if your solution succeeds? What are those unintended consequences? Now, I'll give you an example from one of DataKind's partners. We worked with a health organization who employed about 20 people in a community to um, digitize their handwritten medical records. Now, I'm going to give you a, uh, an example later where this was a really successful project. So we said, we know how to digitize health records. We've done this with another partner. Would you like us to build a data science solution that does health record digitization for you? Uh, it would save you a lot of money, save you a lot of time. The organization came back to us and said, it's not worth it. We don't want to digitize because we employ 20 people to do this. And if we were to take away the jobs in that community, that would go against our code of ethics. So we have to think about the implications of a when our solutions work, what are the unintended consequences of those additional efficiencies, of those targeting tools. Um, and we need to understand and prioritize for all scenarios from the beginning. Now, we also need to learn from experience and listen to all voices. A data scientist sitting in a room like me, I'm talking to you from my living room right now, uh, I have a point of view and I have an idea of how I can use data science and data to create a solution for you. But my solution will be incomplete if I'm not talking to the end user and the end impacted individuals. Um, in order to build successful data science for impact solutions, we have to learn from experts and learn from experience and listen to all voices in that room. We also have to focus on leverage points for that systems change. So data science, it can make a lot of change. It can help improve a number of systems, but it doesn't make the rules. It just follows the rules. So you have to understand what is the system that you're putting your data solution within and where is that leverage point where it can be impactful for you. I've got two more how to do this. So the first is, got to design your solution for the right level of data maturity. Now, uh, we all love data, uh, AI, you know, chat GPT is the huge buzzword right now. Um, we have to build solutions where they are. And sometimes that's just a basic app. Sometimes that's a dashboard. Um, data science and data solutions can exist in many forms and they don't have to be the thing that's cutting edge. It should be the solution that is useful to your organization at the level it needs to be useful. And then finally, at DataKind, we're big believers of a solution having 
six components. Now, folks on the line, you're probably social actors and subject matter experts. Um, so you are two of those six components, people who can speak to the problems that are being faced in the community and uh, subject matter experts as to what is that solution space. And if you're on the line, you might also be a funder. We need funders who are willing to take a chance on these new types of solution building, who are willing to say data and AI is important and we're going to start that journey with you. Um, we also need a really strong problem statement. Remember that start with the question, not the data. Um, we need to know why we're doing this project. And then yes, um, your final two components are those data sets and the data scientists, but they aren't the lead for a data for good project. They are those last components you bring together. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about why we would use data to drive social impact, talked a little bit about what are some of the uh, essential rules or guidelines for doing these data for impact projects. Let's talk a little bit about some examples. So what impact can we have um, if uh, we use data to drive positive social change? So the first example I'm going to share with you is from an organization, Riders for Health. Um, and this is using compu computer vision to save time and lives. So I want you to picture uh, the state of, you know, you, you go to your, your doctors, you, you probably see the mountains of medical records that are available, um, you know, and a nurse has to pull it out. And if you were moving, you had to carry pounds of records from like house to house or uh, doctor to doctor. Now, Writers for Health operates in five um, African countries in partnership with the Ministry of Health. Um, and their riders, what they do is they deliver healthcare in these hardest to reach areas. They have couriers who drive on motorbikes, hence the Riders for Health. And so all the health information for the communities they serve have to be carried with them. Um, and they do this in handwritten logbooks that generate 1,500 pages of records daily. It's an astonishing amount of information. And they're carrying this place to the place. And this is incredibly labor intensive. It limits the volume and frequency of visits they can make to health facilities. It causes delay in diagnosis and treatment and impedes the team's ability to make information-driven decisions because the digitization process of these thousands of pages it's 30 to 60 days. They take the, the records, the records stay in a health facility. They end up getting uh, digitized at the end of a reporting period. Now, think about COVID, you know, this epidemic, uh, this pandemic that we all lived through and continue to live through. If it took us 30 to 60 days to get digitized information of who in our community was testing positive for COVID-19, our pandemic experience would have been radically different. So what Riders for Health wanted to do was, could they figure out a way to digitize this health information faster so that they could increase disease surveillance, so they could understand and respond to health threats in their community? Um, and could they respond more quickly to that those diagnostics and reduce the amount of data that they had to carry around manually each day? And so what we did for them is we built a tool called Rocker. Uh, which is Riders Optical Character Recognition. It's a tool for handwritten paper form uh, to digital transformation. And it works in um, a really simple way. You have a phone where you can take a picture of the health record that has been handwritten. It saves that, the, the application saves that form until an internet connection becomes available. And I want to just mention this as this is a key of designing with your partners. We as a data science team, that is a global team, we were designing with the assumption that we had broadband capacity, not unlike what we might have here in the United States. Riders for Health was operating in rural Nigeria, where there is only a, uh, a data hub uh, in the city centers. So they needed a pathway to save the information and do digitization later. Once the, uh, they connect to the internet, um, they, the form image is sent through this, um, this model, this OCR driver, and the results are turned in an app. Um, so you can see, okay, here's what was handwritten. Here's what the, uh, the form detection thinks these numbers look like. And then as a human, I have to correct anything I think is wrong, and then I can save it to a database. This changed their process 
from weeks of time to digitization to mere hours. They could digitize at the end of every workday. Now, it sounds like a really fancy process. Riders for Health, they're operating in these incredibly hard to reach areas. They do not have sophisticated data systems. And you don't need a sophisticated system to see the power of a sophisticated solution. This is where building an app or building this behind a simple front end is really key. Also, I guess you might say why, you know, we are call, we're talking a lot about work in um, central Florida. Why are you talking about Nigeria? Well, I bet every single one of our organizations, I think, you know, Sandy and Rachel, I bet you have mountains of paperwork of grant applications, of treatments. You know, we are all like less than 20% of information is still digitized. The amount of information that we could pull together if we had digitization processes could radically change almost every aspect of service delivery. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, one another project. So this is with working um, with organizations like New America's Future of Land and Housing Program, Bright Community Trust in Central Florida, and many other organizations. And we're really working on helping local leaders combat the impacts of housing insecurity. Now, this starts with some sobering facts. Um, and this even, this is a, it was an issue pre-pandemic when we started this work back in 2018. Nearly 5 million Americans lose their homes through evictions and mortgage foreclosures each year. And policymakers lack systematic and data-driven ways to identify where that housing loss is happening and who is most affected by it. There is not a national database of eviction information or of foreclosure information. So a policymaker is working with that data on a very local level and attempting to analyze it very locally. So this is a real patchwork. Um, yet actionable and accessible housing loss information is critical to empowering local government officials on how to best direct resources to those most in need. Something we saw very acutely during the pandemic with emergency rental assistance dollars that needed to be distributed. So what we did was we realized that Datakind uh, as an organization, we could work individually with a number of uh, counties across the United States to help them understand their data. And we, we did that. And it was a key uh, activity that we did at the start of the pandemic to help the distribution of millions of dollars in, in emergency rental assistance. But we realized there's over 3,000 counties in the United States. Um, Datakind and New America, we as a team, we couldn't work with every single county individually. So we needed to build a tool. And we built a tool called the Foreclosure Eviction and Analysis Tool. It's an open source tool that any uh, individual can pull offline and use. Um, we developed it with 14 uh, cities and counties as partner sites. Um, and we also learned through the process of what are all these national guidelines that should be in place for um, building and managing these types of solutions. And what it is is any user can come to this tool with their own locally held eviction data. So if uh, you're, you're live, you have, uh, this is publicly available data, you can pull it from your local government's website, bring it to this tool. You can look at this and kind of say some magic happens, but you br bring your data, you put it into this tool and you get in outputs that are visualizations and compiled reports. Um, now, what I want to show you is some of the, the understanding that this type of information can unlock. So we say, where do we need rental assistance in Orlando? Um, we can look at this map and see, oh, those areas that are lightest colored, those are the areas where evictions were highest pre-pandemic. So if we were gonna put eviction to all, uh, rental assistance dollars in place, we likely want to target those communities. Now, if we, kinda, if we want to dig a little deeper, what do those communities look like? And frankly, what does the housing trend look like? We can see low uh, drops in evict, we have seen drops in evictions in times where there was a moratorium, you can see spikes soon after. But in uh, Orlando, those ho that housing loss occurred more uh, in census tract neighborhoods that had a higher percentage of African-American individuals, higher percentage of individuals who were employed in service occupations, who use uh, SNAP benefits. So not only can we actually understand where individuals are losing their homes, we could also start to get a sense for 
um, by linking together data sets, what are other services that might need to be provided alongside rental assistance? Now, when we actually look to see what rental assistance dollars were distributed, we would expect a relationship saying places that had really high evictions, they would also be getting the highest amount of uh, eviction assistance dollars to keep them in homes. And while that is mostly true, we actually see some real outliers of these uh, counties represented by these circles where they, they're dramatically under where we'd expect to be in terms of dollars uh, assigned. And if we go back to our map, those are actually the two uh, census tracts, those two neighborhoods that had the highest number of evictions being filed um, and uh, the communities at most need. Now, I'm really proud to say with this data, a uh, local state representative, um, Representative Ana Eskamani, was able to take this information and in 36 hours, take her boots on the ground door knocking team to get 600 families enrolled in rental assistance. So it's an amazing use of data directly into action. Now, I'm gonna give you one final example and then uh, have a little conversation about uh, data for impact. So I hope this is exciting you and sparking uh, questions as, as, uh, as you go along. So my last project is a very local one. It's with the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center uh, based out of Jacksonville, Florida. And the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center, what they do is they um, bring together data from across the state to tell the very local story of uh, young women and girls uh, and their intersection points with the justice system. Um, and they've shown some incredibly sobering statistics that many girls are in peril. Girls are uh, facing rates of violence and victimization in their communities, schools, and homes. They have significant rates of hopelessness um, and our communities have to take action. Yet it is so hard to take action in part because the information, the data that could unlock our action taking um, is, is in many different locations meaning it takes hundreds, if not thousands of hours to pull that information together and an analyze it in a way that can push for change. But if we were able to build tools that can automate that data collection and that data analysis, the Policy Center and organizations like them could do their work of impact more readily. So what we did for the Policy Center is we actually pulled together about 13 different data streams to build them a dashboard that allows them to look at a very local level, a county level um, for the intersection points between um, girls uh, and discipline from the uh, Department of Education, from the Department of Juvenile Justice, um, and, and multiple other sources to say what is happening to girls in this particular area. And by pulling together those many different data sources, we're also able to say we can see where the relative rate of occurrence is just is wildly exceeding expectations where perhaps there's a very small population of uh, black girls, but their arrest rate within the juvenile justice system is three times what their population uh, occurrence looks like. And so by having those different data sets brought together and that type of analysis, we're able to see the areas that are of key importance for direct intervention in a way that wouldn't have been possible without that piece of analysis. And I was really excited to, to be able to share this quotation from to, with you from uh, Vanessa on the, the team at, um, at the Policy Center uh, for just how impactful this type of work is for letting them go forward with their, their great uh, community work. So Datakind, we've done over 350 of these projects. What have we learned? So what are some guidelines for you? So successful data for social impact projects, the partnerships are organizations need to be mission driven with a clear theory of change. You need to have a pathway to utilizing digital data. Doesn't have to be your own data. In fact, that last example I gave you from the policy center, that was all public data from many different sources. And you need to have project leaders who are committed to using data to make decisions and need to have resources that can sustain your solution long-term. Got to be able to have designed something that your organization can continue to take forward. Doesn't That doesn't rely on that one expert fellow who came to you from a summer program. 
And when we look at the most successful data for social impact solutions, we see that these solutions de-risk the space. So they are, they are a solution that is approaching uh, the problem in a new way, and they're adding to that field. They are solutions that focus on the critical problem so that they are, they, they are focusing on the problem that needs to be solved, not just what can be solved. They are solutions that use appropriate technology. Um, they provide solutions um, that are overseen by the people doing the work. So um, that you have that field team directly engaged. And when those solutions go beyond an individual organization, looking at platforms and partners for scaling. So looking to work through already existing knowledge networks and collaborations. All right, it's a whirlwind. Um, I know I've seen questions coming in now, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a second. Um, and ask Sandy and Rachel to pop on um, to talk a little bit about data for impact. Um, so with that, um, Rachel, I actually didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself earlier. If you want to give a quick intro, and then I'm going to just ask you for your, your reactions. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Allen. I'm the executive director of the Peace and Justice Institute. And I'm just really happy to be here today with you and Caitlin and Sandy and the team to be having this conversation. Thank you. Well, we're so glad to have you here. Um, so, Sandy, uh, I've been talking a lot, um, but you know, as I said, this, the Central Florida Foundation was one of my inspirations here. So, I'd love to have you tell us a little bit about, you know, your your focus is on high impact philanthropy. You're managing hundreds of nonprofits, you know, who you're supporting. You're you're seeing the flow of millions of dollars that you steward. How is data key to your strategy? I think it's really important to our strategy. Um, you know, we have created a framework. Um, you can see the little logo in the back called Thrive Central Florida, which is really focused on um, the social determinants of health and also the sustainable development goals from the UN using those as indicators for are we going in the right direction? And we spend a lot of time looking at trend data. But we also do what you said earlier in the conversation. We start with the problem statement. What is it that we're trying to solve? And we have several work groups that are working in these spaces right now. Not all of our grants are driven by data. Some of them are driven by needs that we know exist in the community. So we do a combination of participatory, trust-based grant making, but really for the biggest portion of our community investment is focused on strategic philanthropy, which includes that data component where we really want to know what is the data telling us, who's accountable for those results, and are we going in the right direction? And in order to know those things, we really have to be able to kind of dig down deep to look at data from quite a few different sources, have those subject matter experts at the table, have people who can interpret the data and be able to let us know, does the data tell us the full story or are there questions that we need to be asking that maybe are below the surface of the data? And I can give you an example of that. When we were, when we're looking at kindergarten readiness, we can look at all of the data around early childcare. We can look at VPK and, and all of those components. But what we're missing in the data is parents or aunts or uncles or neighbors or grandmas who are taking care of the kids in the process of raising those children and getting them ready for kindergarten. So there's a whole big data set that may not exist. And so we have to be mindful of what data we can get and what data may still be kind of out there that we have to account for. And so for us, it's really important to be able to spend time looking at that, understanding it, and then looking at what are the solutions that we can apply to that. And kind of our strategy is to look at things that we can pilot, scale, accelerate, or fill gaps. I love that that framing of of pilot, you know, piloting through accelerating. Right there's there's so many ways and so many levels that that data can be used for. Um, Rachel, you you were telling me a, a story the other day that that seems so just innate to how you work of, oh, you brought together a, 
it seems like dozens of people in the Central Florida community to work on solving a problem who had never worked together before. And frankly, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't have expected them to come together. And uh, I heard that story and I immediately was like, man, data must have been a part of it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you see data being this, maybe a common language or this way that we can bring together um, teams toward, you know, collaborating toward a shared goal? Yeah, I mean, when when we encountered the issues around policing, and, and I think they're ongoing, and we've learned a lot in our work with the police and the community, but when we encountered um, the incidents we saw in the media and then the data that followed, there was a concern in our community. And then we had some local incidences, specifically I'm talking about 2015, um, of excessive use of force with our local police department in Orlando. And again, that concern. And I, and I think that's, you know, the data can verify what we see in the media and that the concern is real. And, and the people that wanted to be at the table were the educators, the police department, the faith community, the city of Orlando, and then residents and parents who are raising children of color, boys of color specifically, concerned. And so, you know, with that kind of data, we created a program called Orlando Speaks, where all of these different people came into the room with enthusiasm because they knew there was a problem, but the problem couldn't be solved with data. It, it needed to be solved you know, with the people. So, um, so that was a unique and exciting project that, um, and interestingly enough, that data could help us create the relationships, which are so critical to bring about the social change that we desire. So I really appreciate the way you're bringing this to our community. Well, we're, we're thrilled to be in the community. And um, I love what you said is like, Data was part of the solution, but it was the people who created the solution. Because that's that's absolutely it. That you know we need to be able to identify the problem, identify the leverage points, and data is a tool that maybe can help us get us there faster or hone in on the problem. Um, but it's not the solution in and of itself. Um, Sandy, I'm actually going to pull a question that that came in from the Q and A. We've had uh, about over 20 questions in this Q and A uh, <laughs> now. Um, but but Matt asked, um, you know. Where do we see the capacity needs for organizations and communities um, in terms of building and sustaining data tools? Um, I could say just quickly from a data kind perspective, we think a lot about meeting a community and an organization where they are, which means building on the tech stack that they're using. So, um, you know, if you're a, a, a you know, Google environment, we're not switching you over to Microsoft. Or if you're on AWS, we're not going to suddenly get you on Azure. So that's one thing we think about a lot. We think about how often someone will use a tool. And does that mean, um, and that does that turn it into an application? Does it turn it into a code base that they run um, just like once a year for some type of reporting? Um, and then we think about training. Um, so like for a data kind, um, our, a big thing we do is we stay uh, in a partnership for six months after we hand over a project to make sure that we've done the training, we've we've you know ensured the whole team can do it. So I mean I answered it from the data kind side, but Sandy, what do you think about like how do you approach these capacity needs when creating data solutions? It's really important, you know, to recognize that not all nonprofits are in the same space that some of them are very small and place-based and in the neighborhood and then others are much larger maybe have larger budgets have the capability of getting more technology and and those types of things and so putting them together and i think similar to what rachel had shared before i think is one of the really important things and that's you know again back to the idea for us of having these work groups is bringing people together around a common problem so that we can look at how to solve it together and being able to utilize the um, you know, more qualitative data from the people who are actually in the weeds, on the streets, hearing about some of the problems, and they can also help to verify it. We've also done some things like town halls where 
we've brought the data to the table more in statistical, you know, here's what's going on in our community. We tend to be on the wrong side of a lot of top 50 lists. We're getting better, but, you know, we've been number one in killing pedestrians, number 48 in per capita mental health care uh, dollars that are being spent. And so, you know, we can look at in those things, what are the things that we can actually work on and try to solve? But I think it's important to do that together. I think there's some nonprofits out there that um, are started because people are passionate about helping people. So they're not necessarily doing a lot of research to know if another food pantry needs to be on that corner or if maybe they should just join up with existing resources. There are times when um, nonprofits don't know the difference between what an output is and an outcome. And so for those, we're starting at a more elementary level saying, you know, in order to be able to work on a particular problem, we have to understand what the problem is and then be able to dissect that problem a little bit so that we can figure out where are the points that we can actually make a difference. And so hopefully that answers it. It's, you know, a little bit complicated. I think when we're working on complex social issues, there's a lot of complexity to it and a lot of things that are interwoven together. Absolutely. There, there are so many, uh, unknown unknowns. Um, and, uh, you, you gave some great examples there. And it actually, um, I'm going to answer a, a question that also came into the chat um, from Thomas, um, asking about, you know, the skills that that tend to be more useful than others. So, um, Sandy, I think you gave um, a really great example of organizations exist at so many sizes and the solutions for each of those particular organizations aren't necessarily going to be the same. Um, you know, I, I think to the the mental model of observing, reasoning, and acting. And so many organizations have to start with observe, that they, they, have to, they have to pull information together in a central location to truly create a true understanding of what the, the world is. And, and it's not to say that those problems can't be complex data science problems. Um, data kind, we worked with an organization called the Harlem Children's Zone um, in New York. And what they their question was help us accurately observe the state of our world. We want to know they had a mission of um, cradle to college services, and they wanted to know an accurate number for how many individuals they serve each year. And that sounds somewhat trivial. Oh, don't you just have enrollment information? Uh, but uh, their program had been working uh, operating for over twenty years. Each service had its own enrollment database, and there was not uh, a consistent overlap between them. Um, so what we had to do is we, we had to build um, a machine learning model that would help identify direct dupes and predict other duplicates and, and really help them clean their system. Um, so just to say, you know, these, you know, to, to Thomas's question here, you know, data science skills that are needed, I would say, yes, they really are in observing uh, the world, bringing those data sets together and making it, uh, making the world uh, visible and understandable um, to stakeholders. Um, but I also think, you know, that, that we are increasingly seeing questions around like resourcing and prediction. Um, and I think both to, to Sandy and Rachel, um, I'm curious if you have an example that, that you might want to share of a time when, when you saw data data be used by by one of your partners or constituents for for impact. I mean, obviously, I can tell a million of them, but over over to one of you if you have an example that you'd like to share. I can share. We've been working uh, in the health and hunger space for quite some time, and you know, in order to really understand what the impact of food is for those who are food insecure, they, um, the Second Harvest Food Bank here locally partnered up with the hospital Orlando Health to look at probably a, a small subset, but around 30 women who were pregnant and being able to have an intervention where they're giving them 
prescribed food. So they put together food boxes that were really specific for the nutritional needs of pregnant mothers. And so following that data and actually having a, a whole series around failing up is, you know, what they called it, looking at what worked, what data were they able to gather, what didn't work in the process, and how do they adjust that as they're thinking about scale. And they've actually taken that program and put it out to several other areas as well. The other thing that, you know, we look at is as we're taking that information and asking the questions about nutrition and health and things like, you know, in our community health needs assessment, obesity, diabetes, childhood obesity, and cardiac issues come up every year as being top issues in our community. But yet, traditionally, over the last few years, we've gotten worse. And these are supposed to be focus areas that we're following. And so, you know, we're looking at that connection between food, food insecurity, and nutrition around those specific diseases. And one of the questions that I ask, just because, you know, I'm always curious, is, you know, we get so many things from the grocery stores that are left over. I used to run a food pantry and we got a lot of sweet treats. We got, you know, whatever bakery things were left over. And, you know, one of my questions was, is anybody asking why these bakeries are actually making too much? Because every day there's a certain amount that is, you know, an overage. And so, you know, that's an area that we're not using data that we probably could be using data. Now, maybe the grocery stores are, and they think that they're predicting how much they're going to sell, but it seems to me that every day there's an excess. And so, you know, that's an example of where we can probably use data better than what we're doing here. That's such a great example. And um, I, I'll just piggyback on a, a project that DataKind did actually sort of in a similar vein with a, a group called Plentiful, um, which was uh, out of the United Way of uh, New York City. And Plentiful had this problem. They they managed the food pantries for um, all, all of uh, the, the um, city of Manhattan. Um, and they, people, um, individuals who needed to access that food, the their option was to go and line up and like hope for that food would come. And Plentiful didn't know how many people would show up on a given day, people would have to be turned away. And then at, uh, at other points, pantries would have an abundance of food that had to be thrown away. So how do you use data and technology to build that like right match? It? And so what we did with Plentiful was um, we first helped them um, with their application to actually book uh, visits so they could see how many people would you know expect to have an appointment to get food, similar to how you would book a reservation at a restaurant, you know, so adding you know a, a level of dignity to that process. And then um, we use that to be able to send warning systems about food, how where where food should be delivered on a given day to reduce the overall food waste within the ecosystem. So I just I just wanted to to echo what you're saying is like absolutely that. Um, you know, this idea of, of sort of resource matching and uncovering where waste is happening is absolutely one of the biggest places that we can use um, data for impact here. Um, sort of shockingly, we're, we're coming up on uh, about 10 minutes uh, left here in this conversation. Um, and I like to close uh, just like every, every one of these webinars with a, a question of what's giving you hope? Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of problems, a lot of social challenges, and we've talked about some exciting, you know, ways to tackle it. So Rachel, I'll start with you. What, what's giving you hope? Well, you know, at PJI, we have principles for how we treat each other. And one of them is to speak your truth. So I'm going to speak my truth. This conversation is very intimidating to me. And I imagine there are a lot of highly educated PhDs, master's degrees on this call that are rocking it. And they're, they're saying, yes. And then there are people like me 
who have a skill with people and a passion and a purpose. And yet this conversation is very intimidating, almost to where it's like, I just sort of want to get out of here. And so I just want to say, I have hope because, well, first of all, I want to say to anybody out there who feels like I do, intimidated, nervous, not sure what the big question is. I think the hope is that data kind is helping us in Central Florida and that we need you, you know, because I, I feel like Peace and Justice Institute, we're incredibly effective. And I remember when you said, because I thought we need data kind because we could be more effective, right? And one time you said, and I wrote it down and I wish I could find the quote, but I need you to say it again. You know, that all that technology that profit making companies use to make more profit, we're going to bring to social enterprise and nonprofits to effect positive social change. And when you said that to me, I said, I am in, we need you. So that's what brings me hope. And um, again, for anybody on here who's thinking, I don't fit in this group, just know that you are not alone because I feel that way too. But I'm going to stick around because I think Caitlin and, uh, and Sandy will help us. Wow, what, what an endorsement. Uh, Sandy, you've got to follow that. What, uh, you know, what, know. what's giving you hope? I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, what gives me hope is one that we live in a community where people are willing to work together. And that is just the start of the magic. And then, you know, to, to Rachel's point, having organizations like yours and people like you who are willing to help us to look at our data in a way that actually makes sense so that we can understand what the next steps are. Because again, a lot of times we think we know what the problem is and we have these ready-made solutions in our minds. And what we find out is that doesn't work. And, you know, I say this often, but um, we outsource our biggest problems to nonprofits that are under-resourced to be able to solve them. And that's as a society. And if the government's giving you money, it's even better because they want to do it on reimbursement. But I think that there are lots of really passionate, intelligent people who have the ability to come together and work on these problems. But we need that data to be able to make a difference. And so, you know, what gives me hope is that one, we're coming together. And then two, that we really do have the ability to look at this data in a different way and to have solutions. And, you know, I think one of our uh, neighbors here, actually Pam neighbors, our career source um, lead, she made a comment that we have all of these really great technologies here. To Rachel's point, we have a simulation industry, we have a tech industry that's really starting to thrive. And we need to be able to take those solutions and apply them to our social issues. And so I think that just really listening to what you're saying and looking at some of the models that you've been able to create and solutions that you've been able to create is very helpful. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the what the two of you just said gives me hope because we need those innovative funders and those innovative community hubs, you know, things like that to, to really say, this is how we're going to do this work. We're going to do it differently. We're going to dream bigger. We're going to reach further. We're going to bring in solutions across these industries that haven't talked together before to make a change so that we can improve quality of life. So we can get you know, off some of those top lists, Sandy, that you mentioned earlier and onto some other top lists. Um, so uh, just thank you both so much for, for inviting us into this conversation and uh, for working um, together and then in bringing Datakind in to, to help work to continue to drive positive social change in Central Florida. Um, I'm, you know, we have just two minutes, so I'm gonna share my screen again to tell people where they can keep talking with us. So, um, you know, uh, I'll just note, we had over a thousand folks register for this webinar, which is a great number. And thank you all so much for attending, for 
uh, uh, watching this recording, for catching us on the live stream. Um, you know, for a for a late Thursday afternoon, the the fact that hundreds of people stayed through this conversation. Thank you so much. We hope that it was the start of a conversation and the start of ideas with uh, that. Um, you know, that that you you're generating to think of how you might drive um, social impact. Um, the Central Florida Foundation runs an amazing uh, event series. They have a calendar that collects all of the events happening in the community. Please follow them. Please also subscribe to their newsletter. Um, great insights, tools, and information coming out um, with the Central Florida Focus, though um, they, they really provide nonprofit resources that are applicable um, nationwide. Um, the Peace and Justice Institute, um, P, uh, they, they are moving uh, to a new domain. So website in, imminent, uh, you can catch them on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also sign up for their um, newsletter. I just created a small URL here for you um, so that you can sign up to hear what's happening next for, for them. Um, Datakind, please subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out monthly. It, it tells you all the places where we're going to be, gives you volunteer opportunities um, with us and with our partners, um, lets you know what's happening next. Um, and if you are an organization who is looking to use data science to work with us, my colleague Quinton um, has been posting a number of links in the chat, but he'll re-up again the organization interest form. It's just a, it's a, are you interested in partnering with Datakind as an organization um, and, you know, helping us get a sense for where your data maturity is. So please share that out with us. Um, also, if you want to keep hearing uh, about data for social impact, we're also hosting a webinar next week on generative AI. I said the words chat GPT a couple of times, GPT-3, open AI. If those are simply buzzwords to you, uh, this could be a great webinar. If you're, you're curious, you think you need to be in the know, also a great webinar for you. Um, if you're deep into AI ethics, um, also a great webinar for you. Um, Michelle Lee, um, who's uh, um, an AI expert um, in, in the data kind community, uh, will be part of a, a leading conversation there around what are the opportunities and risks for social impact organizations on generative AI. Um, so with that, um, thank you again, everyone who um, joined us. Uh, please reach out to us by email if we didn't answer your questions, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. So thank you.